Okay. First of all, thank you so much for coming. All I want to do today is to give you a heads up on a proposal that we'll be making to the Board of Regents next week for our tuition and fees. And this is a proposal, remember it's not, it's not been approved yet, but it will be in the agenda book that comes out on Friday and we thought local media deserved a big preview and had it anyway. So that's the purpose of this today. And uh, before I get started, I wanna thank Marty Baylor the entire committee that, uh, that Marty chaired, I gave them some impossible tasks and they pulled them off. So uh, I'm very pleased with the, the outcome of this. The, first of all, there are certain principles that we were trying and certain goals we were trying to achieve with tuition and fees. First thing we wanted was complete transparency. And if you uh, have ever had a child go to college or gone there yourself recently, you know that the the tuition and fee thing that you read in the catalog is usually not what you pay. There are other kinds of fees, uh, course fees, all kinds of fees that you didn't really know about. But we wanted something that was con completely transparent. We wanted you to be able to look in the catalog, see a figure, and that'd be your total academic cost. That's what you're going to pay. Okay. So what we're trying to do is do something that's it, where, where nothing is hidden. Everything is completely transparent. Uh, Second thing, we wanted predictability. I wanted you to be able to start school at UTRGV and in your freshman year, know what you were gonna pay and know that you'd be paying the same thing when you graduated as a senior. We wanted complete predictability. We wanted that for graduate students too. If you start a PhD program, it's gonna take you four years. We want you to be paying the same thing at the end as the beginning. So complete predictability. That's the second thing. The third thing, we wanted to incentivize you to take uh, the maximum number of courses you can handle and to graduate as soon as possible. The best thing you can do to control cost in higher education is to graduate on time or graduate early. And so we've tried to incentivize that behavior with this tuition fee structure. <clears throat> Last but not least, it has to be affordable. We know that our students uh, uh, have some constraints on I was a first-generation college student. I remember uh, well you know, how, how, what a struggle it was. And so we wanted an affordable rate. So to start off with, we decided that we would eliminate as many fees as we could. What, what we tried to do, remember people talk about tuition, just really tuition and fees. And so we, it, there are a number of fees that we won't be assessing that were present in both of the legacy the institutions or one or the other of the legacy institutions. Things like information technology fees, library fees, advising fees, uh, records registration, international education, all of these things, those fees are just eliminated all together. So those fees won't be there. Now, most course fees, except those that are statutorily required, have been eliminated as well. Again, I ask uh, our, our chief financial officer to try to get rid of as many fees as possible, simplify the structure. So these things won't be charged. And distance learning, you know, if you take courses in distance ed at most schools, you've got an extra fee there. We tried to get rid of those as well. What we wanted was uniform rates across all the campus and for all modes of instruction. That makes sense, just one complete uniform rate. Okay, uh, then I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have guaranteed rates what you start off with as a freshman is what you'll be paying as a senior. What we, so you'll have four years. Uh, uh, and, and, and by the way, if you graduate early, you can carry over that, uh, you know, the unexpired uh, uh, piece in, into your graduate work as well. So there, you could use that for graduate coursework. And then we make guarantees for master's and doctoral programs. Now, <clears throat> here's the other piece. There is a 12-hour cap on academic charges. And this is everything except things the state required lab and supplemental fees. But if you take 15 hours, what's that mean? Cost you the same thing if you take 12 hours, right? So you're paying the same thing for 15 as for 12 hours. What happens if you pay, if you take 18 hours? You still pay the same thing. And you understand if you, if you take six courses a semester, 
you can graduate a semester early, it didn't cost you a penny. All three. We're trying to incentivize graduation rates. We want people to graduate. Okay? Here is what we're proposing to the board. Uh, and again, this remember because these are guaranteed rates, this is a graduated scale here depending on how many hours you have. If, if you start the university with 90 credit hours under your belt, that would be your tuition guaranteed for a year. If you have 60 to 80 hours, basically if you're a junior, uh, you'd have guaranteed for two years at that rate, sophomore guaranteed at that rate, and then if you're, if you're a freshman or an entering freshman, you can see what they would be. And remember, they're four-year guarantees. What does that mean? No tuition increases, no fee increases, and fee increases are the things that get you. This is total academic cost. And notice that what we say, TAC, total academic cost, okay, guaranteed for the whole time. Uh, for graduate students, we have uh, a guaranteed rate for two years, and you can see what the, the total cost would be. And for a doctoral student, guaranteed cost for four years. This is the best bargain in American higher education at the doctoral level. I think anybody would say, same thing at the master's level. Great bargain there as well. And uh, for the MD, uh, again, it's a little bit more complicated, but the, the proposed tuition and fees for our for the MD degree is among the best in the nation. And so I'm, I'm very pleased with that as well. We, we think that that's a good uh, as well. Okay, financial assistance. One of the reasons I asked our CFO to look at this and try to put as much into tuition as possible and as little into fees, if we charge tuition, their designated tuition, we have to set aside 20% of that for financial aid. So in many universities, you'll raise fees rather than, than tuition for that reason. But we wanted to put it in tuition because we wanted the additional financial aid. This tuition and fee package we put together will provide us with an additional $4 million set aside for need-based aid. Okay, That's a pretty pretty nice additional set aside for need-based aid. We're commitment, we're, I'm sorry, we have a commitment to both need and merit-based aid. We want to do like other universities and give scholarships to really high-performing students, but we also recognize financial need as well. Uh, we're also committed to student employment, uh, in, including assistantships. We, we think that if you're a student, and many students have to work, I, I worked when I was in college, the best thing you can do is work on campus. So we're, we're committed to trying to find as much student employment on campus as possible. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, things like dual credit, concurrent high school enrollment, no charge for that. There won't be any, any tuition or fee for that at all. Okay, here is an example of how, some, how our tuition fee structure might look. Let's say that uh, you're an entering freshman and your total academic cost is $3,665. You get a Pell Grant, $2,925. A Texas grant of $2,500. You can see that the $4,525 exceed your total academic cost by $1,700. We, we think that this program will be uh, affordable for, for our student body. Okay? If you've got only a Pell grant, you would be within $700. With an extra $4 million, do you know how many $700? Dollar scholarships you give. I want to ask you. <laughs> I think it's about six thousand, but I just did that math in my head, so don't, don't quote me on that. But it's, it's quite a it's quite a few. We, we think we think we can really help uh, make this very affordable for our students. Okay, and now how did we how did we come up with this? Well, as I said, we appointed a committee to look at this, headed up by our chief financial officer. We have public uh, forums. Uh, our Student Government Association participated in this very strong. By the way, our brand new president of the Student Governance, Government Association, the founding or inaugural president of the UTRGV Student Government Association, Alberto Anime is here. 
and uh, you raise your hand. And if you have, yeah, excuse me. And he'll be happy to answer the question. Well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, that's what you get. You know? <laughs> Great preparation. We're all going to be working for him one day. <laughs> so, uh, then we did surveys and we had broad campus involvement. So that's that's basically how we reached this. But as I said, this is the package we'll be taking to the board. I was very proud of our our committee and uh, our folks for doing this. And uh, uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, if you have a question or two, I'll be happy to answer it. Or uh, if you ask detailed questions, I may pass it along to somebody else. As I said, Marty Baylor, our, our CFO, is here. Uh, Alberto is here. And so uh, we have people from financial aid. Oh, we are right, right <laughs> under them. Yeah. And, and also uh, uh, our uh, enrollment management guru is here too. So and Maggie, you right? Yeah. So we'd be happy to, to address the question. Yes. Well, uh, can you talk about the rate increase from UTD to UTPA? I understand there's still uh, a little bit of an increase there. Yeah, I don't know exactly how much that, that will be, and it's a little bit like comparing apples to oranges because we don't know how many course fees and other things you would have had. So you can compare the published rates, but you probably can't compare the actual cost. Does that make sense? Right. And so what we were trying to do is, is have a cost that I mean, you look at, this is my total cost. So I, I can't, I, I don't know that I can give you an apple to oranges comparison. Uh, Marty may be able to help you some with, with comparisons there. Were you guys still expecting though, uh, 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 some, and especially for if you're coming in as a freshman, because remember we're guaranteeing, guaranteeing this for four years. We're, tell, we're telling you we're never going to raise this. So yes, but of course freshmen haven't paid a rate yet. So with people who've been going to school, we try to keep those figures as close to what they're paying as possible. If um, you're building this predictability in these set rates, how do you account for inflation uh, as an administration? What cost for that? Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> well, the good news is that in the United States recently, we have not had much inflation. That's unlike when I was in college, by the way, uh, and in graduate school, we had runaway inflation. But so we, we think we've been conservative in doing this to account for inflation that will occur if, if it's a small rate over the next few years. The other thing is we're committed to be to, to being as efficient as possible in our institution. We're always looking for ways to, to create efficiencies. But we think we've built that in. Uh, the redo. Again, and I'm basing inflation on the last few, few years, we think if it's at that level, we're very shape we built that in. How innovative is this? Um, are other universities in the UT system doing anything similar? Uh, people are doing something similar. First of all, I think it's really innovative. I've never seen any program anywhere have guaranteed rates for graduate students. And we've got folks from around from, you know, our provost is in Delaware, our VP for research comes up down here from Aggie Land. And so, uh, I, I, and it, it's been in, in NSF. We've had people who've been in a lot of different places, and I think they'll tell you they've not ever seen the tuition guarantees. I think the other thing is, so there are there are people, University of Texas Dallas gives a four-year guarantee, and is there somewhere else in the system that doesn't? Most of the UT system is offered as an option. As an option, yeah, but not as a mandatory thing. The, the thing that I think is most innovative and thing I'm most pleased about is the elimination of as many fees as possible in the movement of the expenses into tuition. I, I think that's very innovative and creative. I'm very happy about it. I don't know anything like the total package that we put together. One other question. Can you tell us why uh, do you feel this is important for our part of the demographic uh, makeup of the big value market? Why do you think this would be important to students? First of all, I think the predictability will. I, I think it's part of the problem with cost in higher education is you've had such wide 
ranging tuition increases. So I think the predictability is very important. I think the affordability uh, is very important and the increased financial aid is very important. So I think that's, those are important for our market. For our students, I think it's very important to incentivize steady progress toward a degree. I, I've said this on a number of occasions, our entire university will be built around helping students move forward to a degree. We want you to come to UTRGV. We want you to graduate. It's really important to us that you graduate. So we're doing everything, including creating a tuition and fee structure that will help move along toward graduation. That's, and we hope you're going to take six courses. I mean, most students can. If you take those six courses, remember, it's a whole semester free. Figure out not only the cost savings, but also the uh, you know the the opportunity cost there if you're not graduating. So there's there's both there's both a cost savings and an opportunity cost. You start working a semester early. You see, so what we're trying to do is to help speed you toward your graduation and get you in the workforce. Now, when you make your first couple of million dollars, I'll come ask you for part of that. But then, you know, <laughs> other questions? Yes. There's a movement afoot in the state legislature to repeal uh, uh, in-state tuition for dreamers, which is a large part of uh, your institution. Do you have a contingency in place should that movement be successful? We don't think it will. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll, we, we would have, we'd have a struggle. We'd really have to, to look at what, I, I think, our, our dreamers are about eight. How, what percent of our student body, Marty, do you have? I believe it's quite eight, eight or nine hundred. Eight or nine hundred. And so we do, it's very important to us that those students be able to go to school, that they be able to graduate. But obviously, we wouldn't be able to use state funds to do it, and we'd have to work with private agencies and to try to garner. So, but but they're very important to us. I mean, that's a, as you said, a significant part of our population. Eight or nine hundred students. That's a lot of students. So they're important to us. I I, I don't think that would pass. I don't know. You, you just never know, do you? So. What are the factors to determine how much tuition costs? How do they how do they determine the tuition? Well, it, it's an interesting question. I, I don't think there is any national mechanism for doing that. What we look at is what does it cost us to deliver the quality of education that we think our students need. For example, we know that faculty salaries are a significant component of that. We want to add faculty. We want to increase our faculty size and increase and, and increase the range of programs available to our students. And so, if you look at all of your costs, faculty salaries are probably the largest cost. And then the, the salaries of support staff. So I have to pay my uh, enrollment uh, management guru back there. I have to pay my financial <laughs> aid director. You know, they, they, they're both really good. And so if we don't if we don't reward them, we'll, we'll lose them to somebody who'll pay them. And so in, in advising, so if you look at support services, the faculty salaries, which is probably the biggest part of that, then your support services. And then you have physical plant costs. And so the state uh, higher education coordinating board does a cost study of higher education every few years and that cost study is available to us and our VP for business affairs is on that you're on the committee that did that Archie Martin so uh, so we have a good idea of what actual costs are and we use that to factor in that's a good question no, no one's ever asked me that question but it was a really a very good question well, they take into consideration the fact that uh, counties, uh, there's two counties that we do the star and the Bible. It's one of the poorest in the nation. We, we do. Yeah. We absolutely take into account, I mean, we serve a market and we understand what our students uh, can afford and, and not afford. And so that, it's absolutely a part of everything we do, we take into account. Uh, we obviously cannot, I mean, our tuition fees will be half of or less than half of what they are at, at uh, 
some other universities around the study. And, I mean, I'm talking about public institutions. And part of the reason for that is that we understand, you know, uh, uh, the financial real realities that many of our students face. How many students are from the area, and how, how, how much you kind of market to students outside of the area? Well, we, uh, the vast majority of our students will be from the area. I can't give you an exact figure because we, we have our first class starting. I can tell you. Can probably get you information about the two legacy school but the vast majority of students are from the area and we see ourselves as first and foremost serving this area now we would like to bring in students from the outside too remember if you bring in students from outside the area they uh, produce economic benefits for I mean, they rent places to live they eat at restaurants they buy at stores if you look at schools like one of my former schools texas tech the 35,000 students who go to school there, most of them not from Lubbock, are a huge economic generator. So once we've served our own students, we'd love to, and we will do recruiting outside the area, because those students will be beneficial to, uh, to our economy here, and they'll also help create a richer uh, educational environment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. and. Uh, so we have some people who can answer individual questions. I wanted to give you a heads up on this, so thank you.